All right, in this video, I will introduce the Muschima++ dataset for handwritten optical music recognition. And because you might not be familiar with the term, I will first introduce what optical music recognition actually is. So imagine we have an image of music notation and we want to process this via computer because maybe we have a couple thousand of these or millions and we would like to extract either the description of the actual music notation so that we can load it up in a notation software or something so we would want to extract music XML or uh, we want to replay the piece so we want probably a MIDI file from that and in order to do this at these scales we really need a computer to do this for us but this is not solved yet who would care about having optical music recognition working? Well, for instance, composers, because transcribing your manuscripts into a computer so that musicians are willing to read it, this is a tedious process. And librarians would also love to have their music libraries searchable with musical content, not just the metadata, like who wrote this, but also what they actually wrote. And all in all, optical music recognition should significantly diversify the sources of music that we have that we can deal with digitally. Because actually most of musical heritage is written rather than recorded, because recordings have been around only for the past couple of years in the big scheme of things. And actually more music is even handwritten than typeset because we, if you are a music publisher, you just typeset the stuff which you kind of know will bring you money. But this is a very small fraction of what people actually did. And also for the famous composers, there are still things which haven't really been published. So I hope now you agree that optical music recognition is something we would ideally like to have. But we don't really have it. 50 years after the first optical music recognition PhD thesis was published, as you can see, we are still not doing too well. And this has several reasons. So first of all, optical music recognition is a hard problem, simply because the writing system that we're dealing with, music notation, is very complicated. But that is just a part of why OMR hasn't seen so much progress as, for instance, OCR or other document recognition subfields. A huge part of the problems of OMR as a field is that the research infrastructure to work on this is very limited, and specifically, we miss datasets. So in this presentation, I will try to convince you of two things. First, that there was no dataset for OMR that would actually help solving it instead of just doing some small parts of the problem. And second, that the Muschima++ dataset is actually this missing piece, which we need to do, make significant progress on this task. So in order to show how specifically the dataset situation is lacking, we will look at how OMR systems are usually built, because this then tells us what data we would need. So I will show the traditional optical music recognition pipeline, how people usually did this. So nowadays people might skip some of these steps and build end-to-end -end systems, but most of literature still refers to this pipeline and there are, it, there are good reasons to split up this task in this way. So once we have the image input, the first thing we might want to do is binarize it. So we divide the foreground from the background. Then this is very general. There is nothing specific to music scores in this step. Uh, the next step, however, is already OMR specific. And we would like to get rid of the staff lines. These are kind of layout objects that span the whole page. And they are responsible for much of the visual complexity. So when things touch, when they cross over, usually a staff line is involved in this junction. So traditionally, you would remove stuff lines in order to simplify segmenting the image for the next steps, which is symbol localization and symbol classification. These two can get grouped together and, and under the term symbol detection or object detection. So we want to find out where things are and what they are, because music notation has this like individual glyphs, like node heads, stems, bar lines, we want to know there is a bar line here, there is a node head here, there is a stem here. 
So that would be the output of this symbol localization and classification stage of the pipeline. And then something magical happens, which is applying the rules of reading music, and you end up with this musical content. You then need to construct the appropriate output representation based on the application you need. So in the beginning, I was showing you, you might need a music XML file if you want to work with a score, or you might need a MIDI file if you want to play it back after you take a photo of, of some music notation. So this shows us what we want some data for. We need data, we need OMR specific data for staff line detection and removal. We need OMR specific data for symbol detection. We need data for music inference. And we might want to measure effectiveness of optical music recognition systems with respect to these output representations as well. So I talk about what we would like. Let's look at what we actually have. So for printed music, you can use synthetic data for all of these steps. There are now people working on getting scripts to extract huge amounts of data. There is a data, there's a deep scores data sets, for instance, from Lillipond. Uh, for printed music, we don't really have to worry. But for handwritten music, the situation is much worse. We cannot synthesize musical handwriting quite yet. So we have the CVC Muschema data set. We also have the Dalits Music Stage dataset, and these are datasets which enable us to do stuff line detection, stuff detection and removal. That was the first OMR specific stage. We, can, we have a bunch of other datasets. We have the Homos dataset, and then Small Runs Are Capitan, and the data of Anare Bello. And these datasets are all meant for symbol classification. So once we have a glyph, we found, we can use this data to train systems to say, okay, this one is an odd, this one is a club, or, or something like that. There is a bunch of other data sets. Uh, uh, my great colleague, Alex Bacha, has compiled a GitHub page of all of these. Uh, but this, the larger and the relevant ones are basically there. So if we check against the OMR pipeline, which we have seen earlier, we see that we have data for two of the usual subsystems. We can do staff detection and we can do symbol classification. And people have recently achieved extremely good results on both of these tasks using modern deep learning methods with convex, etc. But if we want to go over the entire pipeline, we are stuck because we don't have data for the other stages. We don't have data for symbol localization, we don't have data for music inference, we don't have the output representations. And of course, people have built full OMR pipelines with various rickety heuristics. But first of all, this does not work on musical manuscripts because they just vary too much. And second, you cannot really trace what your system is doing in these stages if you don't have a data set on which to measure it because you're just eyeballing a bunch of examples you selected yourself. So this is not good for replicable research. And the problem with end-to-end -end OMR, which skips this pipeline, is that the system is then just limited by your end representation. And a lot of the formats that you in practice would use, for instance music XML, don't have facilities to describe the score image very explicitly. So unless you take a very high level view like image captioning, you are stuck with something that is hard to plug into a trainable model's loss function if you use these output representations. So by now, I hope you are convinced that optical music recognition really needs a data set that would enable you to solve the problem of extracting musical content. And in the rest of the presentation, I will try and convince you that our Muschema++ data set does in fact enable OMR research to get to its finish line. So if we're making a data set, we first have to decide what information we need to record, what our ground truth will be, what's the valuable thing about the data. In our case, we need the ground truth to lead towards actual goals of optical music recognition. These are twofold, again, as illustrated on the introductory slide. Either you want reprintability, which is recovering how the music notation was written, how this the, the ideal score, so to speak, 
or you want replayability, which is kind of self-explanatory, just take a picture and play back what's actually in, in, in those notes. And our ground truth format should then address both of these concern, concerns. And also we want to be, we want our ground truth to be very future proof because annotation is expensive. We don't want to do it again a few years later. Also, explicitly annotating things is definitely much better than uh, just having some implicit rules in place, hiding things under algorithm. It's better, it's better to have like clearly marked things which are actually in, in the data which we're describing. This is actually why music XML is an inappropriate format. It hides a lot of things in its defaults in the rendering algorithms that use it. So because of this explicitness, uh, this is, music XML is not a good choice. So what would be a good choice? Well, for simple localization, uh, it's trivial. We just record where symbols are on page. However, we also need to address the problem of extracting musical content from the recognized symbols. Remember that we described this as reading music, but reading music, this is an algorithm. And as I said, as ground truths, we need something static, we need something explicit, we need something that you take and plug into a loss function. But creating a static description of the musical score that captures whatever is necessary for extracting this musical content from the symbol locations and classes, which is the output of the previous stage, this is not trivial. And in order to design this mysterious ground truth format that would bridge the gap between the written score and the encoded content, we actually need to go into how reading music works, how music notation actually encodes its content. And to do that, we need to specify what we mean by this elusive music term. And the current answer is for nearly all music written in standard music notation, it's notes. And notes can be described in terms of three parameters. This is the useful minimum. They have pitches, they have onsets, and they have durations. Which means, which key do I press, when do I press it, and how long do I keep pressing it for, if you're a pianist. But, how is this actually done? So first of all, this content is not encoded locally. So imagine you want to know what pitch is on that note that you're marked on the right. If you just look at the note as is, you are not going to find the answer. So the first thing we need to do is look at the beginning of the line and there you will see a clef and a key signature. And the clef tells you how do I interpret this note with respect to the staff lines that are around it. How do I translate its position on the staff into a key? And the key signature adds some global modifiers. So again, imagining this on a piano, if there is a modifier called a sharp for the four key of F, then instead of F, which is the white key, you would play F sharp, which is the black key next to it. So this is kind of the global information or global for a given line of music notation for a given stuff. And if we look at this information, we would say, okay, this note is a D4. But this is not it, unfortunately. Look at this guy. There's another sharp, and this is a inline accidental, so to speak. It, it's a modifier which is only valid until we reach the final bar line in the music. And it's not a D sharp, therefore, it's, a D sh uh, it's not a D, it's a D sharp 4. So it's not even enough to look at the beginning of the line. You actually have to read the whole line in order to figure out what this note should be, like which key does this symbol translate to. And to generalize this, music notation is a featural writing system. This musical content is not encoded by individual symbols. It is encoded by configurations of symbols. Right? This is an important insight. 
because this tells us exactly what our ground truth representation will be. It's gonna be a graph. Because a graph is a natural representation to capture configurations of music notation symbols. We just show which are related to each other, which should be read at once. How do you need to interpret this bunch of symbols in order to get this D sharp out of there? This is what a notation graph looks like. The vertices of this graph are the individual notation symbols. So node heads, stems, sharps, clefs, etc. The vertices all have some attributes. They have a class label. So this vertex is a node head. They have a bounding box, which means this vertex is like from row 130 to row 137, column 65 to column 72. And they also have a pixel-wise mask within this bounding box, because if you look at those beams, at, the, at those horizontal lines, you see that their bounding boxes overlap quite a lot. So we record which foreground pixels actually belong to which symbol. We don't stop with the bounding box. These are the vertices of our graph. And the edges of our graph record these relationships between symbols that together form interpretable configurations. The important, in, the important insight here is that in the music notation world, one node head corresponds to one note in the music world, in this nebulous music world. So this is a starting point, this is an important starting point. And this way we need our edges to encode relationships that allow us to recover the pitches, durations and onsets of the notes associated with individual note heads. So for the pitch, as we have seen in the example before, we need the relationship to the staff and to the appropriate place on the staff, which is either on a line or in the gap between two staff lines. These are the small purple lines I probably cannot see them. We also need to, for, for each staff, to assign to it a clef so that we can interpret the, the staff lines. And we need to assign to it the key signature in order to read it, to take into account these global modifiers, the, the global accidentals. And if, if the node head has a local modifier, this inline accidental, we need to record a relationship to that as well. And notice how on this graph, what used to be a large distance in the picture from the node head to the clef suddenly becomes a relatively short distance in the graph. So there is one edge to the staff line, or one edge to the staff, and from the staff there is a one edge to the clef. So in this way that the graph overcomes this problem of non-locality. The next step is recovering its duration. This is significantly easier actually. Uh, we have to record what kind of node head this is. This is already in the vertex label, so empty node heads have a different duration than full ones. And we need to see whether it has a stem and how many beams or flags does it have. And this allows us to say, okay, it's a half node, it's a quarter node, it's an eighth node. Uh, this is actually quite local. There are some things like tuplets, so, for instance, there might be triplets in the music, which is a duration modifier, but again, we use this graph to bypass the fact that this is encoded somewhere else, somewhere locally. We have symbols for tuples. And last, we need to encode the onset. And this is a little more complex, because the onset of a note depends on the onset of the previous note. Right? You play the notes in order, there is a quarter note which starts at beat zero at, at the beginning of the music, and then you go on to the next one, that's an eighth note, this begins one beat after the first one, the next, let's say, eighth note begins half a beat after the previous one. Fortunately, again, oriented graphs give us a way to do this, we just use precedence edges, those green lines, they encode the order in which to read the note heads. The notation graph itself is not necessarily the best representation for any specific experiment. 
So for instance, for object detection, you would only want to use maybe the pixel masks and the class labels. But this representation fully describes the given score. Once you have the notation graph, you can forget about the underlying image and you will lose nothing. So this is the future proofness of, of the notation graph. It actually does the job of fully describing a score. And we can progress from this to the output representations. As I mentioned, we already have MIDI extraction implemented and extracting music XML and other music notation representations is possible, supposedly. So if we go back to this pipeline, we can fill in the three dots of, of magically inferring music and make Gandalf go away. We perform notation assembly, which means obtaining the relationships between the detected symbols. Once this is done, then the music inference step is unambiguous. For the statistically inclined, this means that you can do it with rule-based methods. You don't need machine learning once you have the graph. Of course, this is only to the extent to which the underlying score itself is unambiguous, but you cannot get more out of that piece of paper. And notation assembly, of course, is not really a new idea. Capturing these logical relationships between notation symbols, uh, this was around in optical music literature, uh, recognition literature since the 90s. But it actually rarely escaped the future work sections. There is the Demus system of Bertrand Coisson, but this one is closed source. It's very hard to get access to that. Uh, Bainbridge and Bell have done the construction engine, but both of these systems are procedural. This is, they do not give you a ground truth format. They do not give you data. They are process, these are algorithms. Uh, and this is how it has been approached in literature as a step in the pipeline. Our contribution here is that for, we formulate this step in the form of static ground truth, notation graph, which enables using machine learning methods for the notation assembly stage as well, for instance, or joint methods or whatever. And it is actually also a dependency graph, while the methods used in both Demos and the construction engine rely on context-free grammars. So instead of a description of the score, they sort of dream up the non-terminals that describe certain chunks of the score. Of course, you can do this very well, but again, it's something extra, it's, it's, it's an extra layer, and it's not really a description, it's an algorithm. So. While there is related work, there are still, I think, some novel contributions in Muslim or Plus Plus. Plus, actually, if you have this the notation assembly stage with static ground truth, it's much easier to trace errors. You can just point to a part of the picture and say, I missed this edge or I made an extra edge here. So I think the dependency graph has significant advantages over these uh, algorithms based on context-free grammars. So now we have figured out what information we want for a page of music. And we need to select which pages will go into the data set. It needs to be sufficiently diverse. But we only have a finite amount of money and time, so we need to prioritize some kinds of diversity over others. And essentially we have one simple guideline ignore things that can be simulated. So we definitely prefer diversity in the music itself, which is the core OMR issue. So we have examples both of simple monophonic music, as well as complex polyphony, single staff music versus music written multiple staves, etc. With respect to the graphical side of things, rather than just the content side, we definitely want to represent diverse handwriting styles which should give us topological diversity. So some people connect things which should not be connected in the score. Some people just leave holes in their handwriting where symbols should kind of touch. Uh, this is something that, again, is very hard to simulate. So we need to capture this diversity explicitly in the data set. 
What we do not care about too much, on the other hand, is diversity of imaging procedures, image deformations, lighting conditions. These are not actually OMR specific problems. And at the same time, they are relatively easy to simulate. And following these design principles, using the notation graph as ground truth, and selecting music to have diversity with respect to notation complexity and topology, we present Muschimo++. The dataset contains 140 annotated pages. This is something like 91,000 manually annotated nodes and 82,000 manually annotated edges between the graph vertices. All in all, there are about 23,000 encoded nodes. So you would get 23,000 MIDI note on events from this data. And the inter annotator agreement, which we measured on a separate document, is about 0.97. You don't need to worry about the specifics of this number, but suffice to say that the ground truth format is very unambiguous. People agree on how to annotate a page of music and they do it quite accurately. Uh, we use images from the CVC Maschima dataset for stuff line removal by Alicia Fornas uh, et al., uh, which already contains most of the variability that we need. It has all of this notation complexity. It had, there are scores by 50 different writers. There are binary images, high quality scans, but as I said, these are like not, image complexity is not the thing we're trying to simulate, so we don't need varied lighting conditions. Plus, there are staffless versions of these images, which are much faster to annotate, because you can do tricks like connected components, etc. This is an example of a simple score from Muschema++, so monophonic music, uh, just very, very simple musical elements. This is an example of a complex score, which to boot is written in some pretty scary handwriting. So you see complex polyphony, you see problems with like instead of round node heads, which is what they should be, you just get this kind of line. Yes, play this somewhere. This is about the range of complexity that you can encounter in Muschimo++. So, at this point, I hope that I was able to convince you of two things. First, optical music recognition needed a new data set that would actually enable solving this core task of extracting musical content from the written score. And second, that Muschimo++ is this data set OMR needed. And because the data and all the tools for manipulating and visualizing the data set are open source, if you indeed are convinced that those two things hold, let's just go ahead and, well, solve OMR already. Thank you for your attention and goodbye.